Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to teach robots to understand the world. So it's a long title. So let's start by first dissecting it. So by teaching I mean training deep neural networks so the robots can understand the world in 3D as we humans do. So not just images. A real 3D uh, scene understanding. And uh, by robots, I mean autonomous mobile robots for the purpose of warehouse logistics. So the idea is that robots and humans work side by side uh, and the robots can take over a hard, uh, messy jobs and be humans can focus on other a more demanding tasks. So every now and then there's a careers day at school and then my kids uh, get to say oh my mom is building robots for a living she's so cool and uh, the truth is uh, I take too much credit. Uh, I get a lot of help from uh, these amazing people at uh, Gideon so uh, and what I'm the very very proud of is uh, these amazing women so uh, these are the women who built the robots and since this is the women in data science conference i would like to pay tribute to them so uh, let's start um, so first uh, these are the uh, hardware engineers, so mechanical uh, engineers, uh, Maria and Josipa. They are designing our robots. Uh, then uh, we have Ivana. She's a hardware Q&A engineer. And another Ivana. Uh, she's a robotics software engineer. And so now that we have hardware, we can start uh, on uh, teaching these robots to really understand the world. But um, to understand it, they first need to see it. And this is what my colleague uh, Maria Knezhevich Bardic is doing. She's a computer vision engineer. So along with this uh, amazing guys from the stereo vision team. She's working on design of our proprietary vision module. Um, so this is a, a, our stereo camera. And uh, she's also working on uh, deep learning algorithms for depth estimation. Uh, so now that we can see uh, the world around us, uh, our robots also need to understand it in a semantic way. So uh, the robot needs to understand that this is the floor and it can safely move around it. And also this is the obstacle and needs to go around it. And these are the humans, so needs to be careful around them also. And to uh, train deep neural networks, we usually need uh, some kind of annotated data. And uh, this is where our Irena Barsic comes in. She's the team lead for data annotation team. And she also performs quality control for our annotations. Uh, well, if we have our labels, so our ground truth data, then we can start uh, training the models. So, uh, meet Agneza. Uh, she is one of the smartest and bravest women that I know. Uh, she's a physicist by training, and uh, she recently um, decided to change career and become machine learning engineer. So, uh, she's mostly working on 3D pose estimation. So basically, she uh, is training a model to estimate uh, rotations and translations of all these different objects in the world. And uh, 
other uh, colleagues are working also on semantic and instinct segmentation and uh, object detection. Um, so, but when you think about it, understanding the semantics of images, where's the floor, where are the objects, is not really enough to move safely in a 3D world. So, uh, uh, for that, uh, we need to reconstruct the 3D world from images. So, we start with these images and we create 3D maps from them and then we can use these 3D maps to estimate our positions. So, uh, this problem is called SLAM, so not Serena Williams' uh, Grand SLAM, uh, actually simultaneous localization and mapping and I'm going to talk a lot about that in the uh, rest of this lecture and uh, also as you can see here uh, I need to design these algorithms to be robust to uh, weather and uh, daytime in, so illumination conditions so I need to use deep learning for for these purposes so basically I am also training deep neural networks uh, and now you've seen uh, these components, so uh, vision, uh, semantic understanding, and uh, localization and mapping, and uh, basically we need to put them all together. And uh, this is what Petra Abicic is doing. Uh, basically, uh, she's taking care of that everything runs smoothly, or to say so, she's uh, working on management of the entire autonomous um, stack uh, and also on robot collaboration. Um, and uh, okay, now our robots can uh, safely move to the environment and better is taking care that everything runs smoothly. Uh, but our robots are not isolated agents. So we have fleets of robots working side by side with humans. And uh, this is the speciality of uh, our Petra Majdin. She is a robotics engineer and a team lead. Um, so she's working on uh, also on multi-robot optimization. So this is a very hot and interesting topic also from the research perspective. Um, so uh, now maybe let's start with the juicy technical details. So I promised you I will talk about uh, visual localization and mapping, uh, which is called uh, also SLAM, and I will focus on uh, deep learning for SLAM. Um, so uh, this is a pretty vast topic, and if you want to learn more, you can check out this blog post that I've written. And uh, be aware, this lecture will be given from a bird's eye view perspective. Um, so, as I said, the task of visual slam is, so we have a bunch of images and we want to uh, recover 3D structure from them. And then we want to use these maps and images, so we take a picture of our surroundings give it to the SLAM algorithm and it should be able to tell us where we are by using only this image that we captured. So, um, why did we choose such approach? So, to answer uh, this question, let us first take a step back to see how was this done historically, so how our ancestors uh, dealt with this problem. So, um, similar as this visual slam approach, our ancestors also relied on their eyes to map the world. So here you can see Moana, uh, the favorite character of my children, and we can say she was a pretty badass navigator. So 
She looked at the sun and the stars, similar as our ancestor looked uh, at sun, stars, mountains and rivers, and these were their features for orientation. And uh, when they captured these features, they carved them into stone and created maps. So there's a proof of this uh, hypothesis. This ancient map, uh, which is uh, 5,000 years old, was find, found uh, on the Bornholm uh, island in Denmark. And you can see these lines are actually uh, uh, grain fields. Uh, so basically uh, visual features encoded into the map. So, but basically, okay, uh, this is a nice story, but we live in a 21st century and we all have smartphones and when we want to go somewhere, we just use uh, our smartphones and navigation applications and go, uh, and, and go where we want to go. So, uh, where does this visual localization uh, come into play in the 21st century? So, uh, the GPS um, as a sensor is a, a nice, very, very nice sensor, especially when coupled with an RTK antenna and calibrated properly. It can provide a state-of-the-art localization. But uh, there are some uh, corner cases uh, or not so much corner cases. So the GPS does not work reliably underground. So say you're traveling to Japan for the first time and you want to find your way around the Tokyo Metropolitan Station. And so wouldn't it be nice if you took a photo with your smartphone, um, give it to some application and then this application could tell you where you are and uh, what steps you need to do to get to your destination. So the same holds for space exploration, so Perseverance is able to safely navigate on the surface of the Mars and there's no GPS on Mars, uh, similar under the water and more down to Earth uh, with surely and augmented reality, we also need uh, precise and accurate maps for this purpose and for the purpose of warehouse logistics also. Uh, GPS is not so much uh, reliable in uh, indoor environments such as warehouses. Um, so, let's explore this warehouse uh, scenario a little bit. Uh, so say we have our robot and um, it's driving around the warehouse and we want him to take these pallets to some specific location, say warehouse area A. So to do so, it first needs to know how to get there. So um, it has to build a 3D reconstruction from these um, images. And uh, it needs to do so in real time. So as you can see here, the map needs to be uh, built in real time. Then it has to estimate its position with respect to the map. And uh, once it knows uh, its position, then it can estimate, okay, the warehouse area A is uh, 60 meters uh, far, and uh, I need to rotate 60 degrees to get uh, there. Uh, so uh, let's see how we actually do that in practice. Um, so uh, we start with image parsing, um, which is called also feature extraction. Uh, and for that we need at least two images that we uh, parse. So by parsing uh, we uh, basically find out what is unique and useful in these images. And once we extracted these features from both images, then we can perform uh, something called feature matching. So we use pairs of, pairs of features in each image 
and create matches. And so from these matches, which we then compute both, so both it basically denotes the camera movement. So how was camera moved from this image to capture this image? And then once we estimated the camera movement, we can update the map with a new image, so new point for which we know uh, the appropriate uh, camera movement. Uh, so let's. Um, so uh, one thing to mention perhaps here is that I will mostly focus on feature extraction and feature matching, and uh, especially on deep learning for these approaches. Uh, so I'll on, I'll briefly mention post estimation and explain why. So uh, let's start. So uh, first. We start with these uh, global image descriptors. Uh, say we have uh, some image, like this image, uh, uh, this is a scene from the Game of the Thrones uh, TV show, which was filmed in the creation city of Dubrovnik. And say you have this image and you want to find out where, where was this scene filmed, so you can visit Dubrovnik and you can visit this, this landmark and take photos and show them to your family. Yeah. Right, so uh, what about these global descriptors? They are, in essence, one-sentence descriptions of these images in a numerical way. So basically for this image, uh, the global description would say something like there are stairs in this image. And these global descriptors are very useful and very nice when we actually want to perform localization. So we have some kind of map, or at least a partial map, like this 3D map of Dubrovnik. And um, we want to uh, quickly estimate where in this uh, city are we. So. Uh, for each 3D point in this map, uh, we can um, we also have some visual information. So we we have the global descriptors of images from this from which these uh, 3D points were reconstructed. For instance, this reference image. Uh, obviously, this is some kind of tourist image, so not from the Game of the Thrones. And um, then we can compare uh, the global descriptors of these images from which 3D map was constructed to this new query image. And we can do, it, do so really fast. And this is what counts. Basically, as the video just showed, we need to be able to do that in real time. Um, so I will not give here the details on how to train such networks. There are several uh, approaches, for instance, uh, NetVlad, uh, dense NetVlad um, gem, um, also uh, pet, patch NetVlad uh, GCL uh, from the last year. And you can check the blog post for more, more details. So let's just think of this uh, global image descriptors like one sentence representations of our images. And they are pretty useful for uh, that quickly narrowing down where we are. But um, we need to do a little better than that if we want our robots to move pallets around. So uh, this is where uh, local features bring in. So you might have remembered this Moana slide. And um, so as our ancestors looked for features like mountain peaks or stars, um, this is also inspired by nature. For instance, these local features essentially represents some kind of uh, local, locally salient appearance features on a particular landmark. And the main question here is, um, 
what makes a good local feature. So we want to design a neural network to identify which, uh, which features are useful for localization and basically we need to have some kind of uh, um, idea what we want to find. So obviously we want to find static scene features. Uh, I mean um, the features on uh, moving objects like uh, vehicles and uh, pedestrians are clearly not informative because now they are here and uh, in the next moment they are not and um, next what we want to do so this is a little uh, digression you may know this gentleman this is one of the pioneers of computer vision uh, Takeo Kanade so he was once asked by students to identify the three most important problems of computer vision as his answer was correspondence, correspondence, correspondence. So we'll keep that in mind when choosing uh, our local features. So what Canada meant with that? So as shown on the previous slide, uh, we can detect these local features and for instance on, on the cathedral the corners of windows seem like a pretty decent features they can be nicely identified they, we can compute a really nice gradients on these features and so pretty decent feature but for scenes like this uh, detecting windows as local features may not be the best solution I mean, take a look at the scene. There's a lot of windows and they all look alike. So to match two images of this scene, possibly from a different viewpoint, would take a lot of time. Even for, I mean, even for us humans, it might take some time. We would not be sure oh, where is this small window on another image because all, all the windows look alike. So basically, what we want to say, we want to find features we would, who would make good correspondences and we want to avoid ambiguous matches. So uh, next, uh, uh, we also want to be robust. Uh, so what does that uh, mean? Uh, robust to <coughs> illumination, so um, is it, uh, I don't know, sunny, uh, is it daytime, is it, uh, for instance, sunset or even night? Um, illumination, uh, um, robustness to weather changes like, for instance, uh, snow or rain, uh, overcast or to vegetation changes vegetation often changes. So for instance, I, mm, we can look at this uh, window feature in all images and um, we need to be able to describe it robustly so it's uh, invariant to these uh, changes in the scene. So uh, uh, Given the difficulty of the tasks, we turn to the deep learning to the rescue. Um, there have been uh, previously some traditional approaches, but uh, given uh, these robustness tasks, they all uh, to some point fail in uh, performing the task. Uh, so let's see how to use deep learning for feature extraction. Well, to do so, we first uh, need to have some kind of ground truth data. So, um, for instance, for object detection, we have bounding boxes. For segmentations, uh, for segmentation, we have masks. Here, the supervision comes in the form of camera movement. So, we have two images. They are captured uh, at different camera poses. Uh, so this one looks a bit left and this one looks a bit right and uh, the supervision would be this rotation matrix and the translation vector between them. 
So, uh, how do we get this? Uh, well, uh, we could ask humans to annotate this, but if you would ask me, I wouldn't be able to predict uh, for how many degrees was this uh, camera rotated and for how met many meters have we moved between these two images. So I think that humans are really not good at all in solving these tasks. Um, another step would be, so okay, we can't predict uh, poses directly, but maybe we could uh, choose these local features and uh, annotate <coughs> pairs of these features between images and create matches. But if you think that um, you might have a video of uh, 1000 images and you need to annotate them all, you quickly come to the conclusion that this simply does not scale, we cannot do that. So we cannot use human annotation. So, uh, what we might do, we might use uh, data augmentations. So. Uh, as in many such cases where real data is hard to come by, we rely on some form of synthetics. So uh, we could take our image, uh, generate some kind of transformation on it, so basically distort it. And since we know this transformation, well, we have then feature correspondences, so we know, okay, this corner uh, used to be here and now it's on this location, so uh, it moved a bit to the right. Um, so, <coughs> and this was actually used to train a quite popular uh, feature extractor called Superpoint. Um, so, the downside um, is this sampling of transformations which are used to distort these images as it may not uh, reflect the real camera movements in realistic scenarios. But uh, I think that it works really quite well in, in practice and it's good enough. Uh, another way that we could uh, obtain ground truth data is that we could use uh, some kind of algorithm, uh, specifically we could use a structure for motion algorithm uh, to obtain the pseudo ground truth. So notable tools are Comap and uh, Open SFM, and um, this is also quite often used in uh, research papers. Uh, I would say even more than these uh, data augmentations, so much, much more. Uh, the downside of this approach is <coughs> that depending on the number of images, it might take a long time. And also for some extreme cases, it requires human verification and manual re-annotation in uh, such cases. So, say we now have our ground truth, uh, so either we used uh, synthetic data augmentations or we used uh, structure from motion to generate both supervision, uh, we can now design our neural networks. So, uh, basically these are encoder-decoder architectures, so we have some kind of a CNN backbone and then we have specific decoder heads, so pre for predicting uh, feature locations and also for predicting uh, feature descriptors. And uh, often we predict some kind of uncertainty or confidence of how do we, tr how much do we trust this feature, um, and um, how to train this. Well, uh, we train uh, on uh, pairs of images, uh, so we minimize the distances between them. So uh, we, we take each image uh, and uh, run it through the network. We obtain key locations and feature descriptors and minimize the 
distances and then back propagate the error back uh, through the network. Um, so we now have our uh, local features um, in both of these images and uh, the next step would be to match them. So estimate the pixel movement uh, and find the correspondences. So basically um, this pixel was previously here and now it is here we want to extract uh, this kind of information. <coughs> so uh, our inputs are a set of query points in one image and a set and set of reference points in the other image. So we have to match two sets. And when you think about it, this is very similar to the NLP problem. So there um, we are translating a set of uh, words uh, in English to a set of words, for instance, in Slovenian. So this is the this uh, nice quote of uh, Fei Fei Li, uh, which, uh, in which she says, we talk a lot about uh, building benevolent technology. Our technology reflects our values, and I completely agree. So uh, also uh, in the area of computer vision, uh, this is the uh, problem of uh, object detection. So uh, this is the, um, I would say, seminal paper of the debtor, which, um, in which transformers were used um, for matching the bounding box, box proposals generated by the network with the ground truth uh, bounding boxes. And so, uh, what do we say to the matching problem? Not today. We use the attention, so either as a, a part of graph neural network in the seminal paper of Superglue, or in the current state-of-the-art Lofter, uh, where we use transformers. <coughs> so how do we use uh, attention for matching? So, uh, consider this scenario. We have two images and they both contain this repetitive checkerboard pattern. And so we now have to match the features from one, one image, so these points, to the feature, to the points in another image. And when you think about it, how we humans solve this problem is basically we look for context. So, here is this notebook, and then we look how has the position of this notebook changed in this other image. And um, uh, this is actually very suitable for the self-attention problem. So uh, here both uh, queries, keys and values come from the same distribution, so from the one image. And uh, by computing attention, we ask ourselves how much is this feature on the notebook important for matching all these other features in the image. So we use this feature as a key, as a query, and act on keys to activate other uh, features in the image. So this is a pretty straightforward standard. Uh, attention pooling mechanism which is used in almost every uh, paper for um, transformers and um, in general attention. Uh, so this is the idea of uh, self-attention. Then we come to a maybe more straightforward idea uh, when we talk about matching. So we have two images and somehow we want them to talk to each other. So we have a left image, uh, I, I will say this is the left and this is the right, so up, up and down. And uh, basically with uh, this cross attention, uh, we want to compute how much is this uh, key point, so this feature, 
which is now a query. Um, what, what would be the best features in this other image uh, which this feature activates? So the queries come from this image and keys and values come from the other one. And uh, this works uh, quite well in practice. And uh, let's look at some of the results. This is the current state of the art method Lofter. Uh, evaluated on these images of cathedrals and um, this, these are the results of the seminal superglue uh, method on one uh, outdoor data set so uh, don't be confused with these red lines here red uh, 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 red matches are more confident, so we also predict confidence, and blue are less confident. Uh, so, um, with this we can compute pretty good matches, and with these matches we start uh, with computing the camera pose, so the actual camera movement. So, um, as I already mentioned, I will not uh, talk about in much detail about uh, camera pose estimation. Those are in general uh, classical uh, optimization algorithms used. So, uh, although there have been some attempts with deep learning, uh, but they produced much worse results and. Uh, in general, it's uh, difficult to generalize between different scenes. So I think that currently this is a reason why these uh, traditional methods uh, still win, at least for camera movement estimates. So uh, we have point correspondences. Uh, this point X uh, is here in the other images. And each pair of points uh, gives us uh, two equations, or two constraints, so to say. And for rotation we have three degrees of freedom, so uh, your pitch and roll, same for the translation, so six degrees of freedom in total. So we need at least three pairs to uh, solve this problem. And we can use uh, some kind of optimization library like series, GTSM, um, PoseLib to perform this uh, optimization. And uh, now we've seen how we can do mapping. And uh, what about localization? Let's see how this works in practice. So, uh, say we have uh, one robot, I'll call him Ozzy, and he drives around on um, some parking, uh, which is unknown to him yet, and he creates a map, and which is all nice. And then we uh, share this map to another fellow robot called Maria, but Maria decides to come to this parking more than a month later, so the vegetation might have changed in that period. And uh, while the Aussie was performing mapping on a sunny day, Maria came to the parking in the evening and it was really raining at that time. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, can Maria use this uh, Aussie's map for successful localization? Well, uh, you can see the answer on the slide. Yes, uh, it can. Uh, she, uh, see, I mean, she can. So here you can see uh, these are the images uh, which uh, Ozzy captured, and these are the images that Maria captured. So you can see here it's raining. And um, you can see here, uh, these lines represent matches between uh, these two environments. And so, 
As you can see here, this is the uh, 2D projection of the 3D map. Uh, Maria is able to successfully um, localize in this uh, Aussie, Aussie's map and with these purple points actually show the 3D points that uh, Maria can see. Uh, so, uh, I believe that this approach of Visual Slam is applicable uh, for the uh, long-term uh, localization and mapping. Uh, um, I mean, it's the uh, natural way and um, it's actually the way that we human used to, we, hum we as humans used to solve these tasks. So with this, I will conclude my talk and thank you for attention and uh, please if you have uh, any questions feel free to contact me and uh, uh, let's get to the questions and discussion. Mm.